So our first speaker is a New Testament historian who has a Master of Arts degree in Religious Studies uh, from Liberty University and is now a PhD candidate in New Testament Studies at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He's a member of the Society of Biblical Literature and of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. Uh, he is the author of three books, the most recent being The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. So please join me in welcoming to this uh, podium, Mike Lacona. Thank you and good evening. It's great to be with you. I'd like to thank Veritas Forum here at UCLA for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate. I'd also like to thank Richard Carrier for the cordial and open email correspondences we've shared prior to tonight's debate. The question before us is, did Jesus rise from the dead? And for me, this is one of the most interesting as well as important topics for discussion. Let me explain why. About 20 years ago, I went through a period of intense questioning of my faith. I was in graduate school at the time, specializing in the study of New Testament Greek and planning on going into the ministry. But at that time, I began asking uh, the tough question, how can I know if Christianity is true? I believed I had an intimate relationship with God at that time, but I started to wonder, is this really the case, or was I really just self-deluded? So I took a step back from my position of confidence and began to look at Christianity, as well as the evidence uh, for many of the major world religions. I also considered the arguments for atheism. And after several years, I came to the conclusion that what I had originally believed had been revealed to me by God's Spirit had now been manifested, or, or I should say confirmed, by history, science, and philosophy. Namely, that God exists, and that he has actually revealed himself to mankind in Jesus Christ, and that Christianity is true. The case for the resurrection of Jesus was especially influential in my decision. Now, the reason Jesus' resurrection is so important is because the truth of Christianity hinges on it. Jesus' atoning death and subsequent resurrection have been bedrock doctrines of Christianity since its beginning. If they didn't occur, the foundation collapses and Christianity is false. The Apostle Paul himself wrote, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. On the other hand, if Jesus was actually resurrected, then it seems there's good reason for believing that Christianity is true. Given this, I think we have a problem if we say, well, my worldview just doesn't allow that. Well, if that's the position you find yourself in, it may be time to change your worldview. That's why this evening's discussion is much more than just an academic debate. The eternal destiny of our souls may very well hinge on what we do with Jesus and his resurrection. So where do we begin? Historical Jesus studies. The eminent historical Jesus scholar, John Meyer, explains it like this. Let's say we have a Jew, an agnostic, and a Christian. This is not a joke. A Jew, an agnostic, and a Christian, all honest historians, all well acquainted with first century religious movements, lock them up in the Harvard Divinity School Library and tell them that they can't come out until they've hammered out a consensus document on what we can know about Jesus apart from theological or faith considerations. That resulting document would portray what scholars refer to as the historical Jesus. Now the real Jesus who walked the shores of the Sea of Galilee may have been more been portrayed in that document, but he's nothing less. Tonight I'm going to focus on a few facts from this type of research that we can know with a high degree of historical certainty that concerns Jesus' resurrection. So obviously I'm not arguing that the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. It's more like what Tom Cruise said in the movie A Few Good Men, it doesn't matter what I believe, it only matters what I can prove. Let's look now at three facts that are strongly supported and acknowledged by an impressive majority of today's scholars. Fact number one, Jesus' death by crucifixion. Nearly 100% of all scholars agree with this conclusion. Let me provide four reasons why we can be confident of this. First, Jesus' death by crucifixion is multiply attested by both Christian and non-Christian sources. Second, the chances of surviving crucifixion, even under the best of conditions, were bleak. Crucifixion and the torture that usually preceded it was an unspeakably cruel process and may have been the worst way to die in antiquity. Many of us have seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, and have witnessed the brutal practice of scourging. This practice is likewise mentioned in um, ancient sources, 
For example, Josephus in the first century refers to a, can you guys hear me out there? Okay. You can hear me? Okay, great. Josephus refers to a man who had been filleted to the bone. A second century document called the Martyrdom of Polycarp mentions how the Roman whip could expo expose a person's veins and arteries. The victim was then forced to carry his crossbeam outside the city walls where then Roman soldiers would take nails and impale a person to a cross or a tree. Then he was left hanging in excruciating pain. In fact, the word excruciating comes from the Latin, out of the cross. In the first century, a Roman historian named Seneca described a crucified victim as being long sickly, already deformed, swelling with ugly welts on shoulders and chest, and drawing the breath of life amid long drawn out agony. Josephus referred to crucifixion as the most wretched of deaths. Only one account exists of a person surviving crucifixion. Josephus reports of seeing three of his friends crucified. He ran to the Roman commander, uh, Titus, who was one of his friends, and, and uh, told him about it. And Titus ordered that the three be removed while alive and provided the best medical treatment Rome had to offer. In spite of this, two of the three died. Thus, even if Jesus had been removed prematurely, be it intentionally or unintentionally, his chances of survival were still very bleak. But to complicate the matters worse, there is no evidence whatsoever that Jesus was removed while alive or that he was provided any medical care whatsoever, much less Rome's best. Third, we can understand that while some debate remains among medical experts regarding the actual cause of death by crucifixion, they are nearly a single voice in saying that Jesus most certainly died from being crucified. The majority opinion is that he died by asphyxiation, and our understanding of crucifixion supports that conclusion. As the ninth, fourth, as the 19th century liberal scholar David Strauss noted, even if Jesus had somehow survived crucifixion, he couldn't have convinced his disciples that he had been resurrected in new life. Imagine Jesus half dead in the tomb, and so he wakes up in the dark and he wants to get out. So he takes his hands that had been pierced by nails, places them on an extremely heavy stone, and pushes it out of the way. And then he's met by the guards who say, where do you think you're going, pal? And he says, I'm out of here, guys. Then he beats them up. And then he walks blocks, blocks, if not miles, on pierced and wounded feet in order to find his disciples. Finally, he finds where they're at. Peter opens the door and sees Jesus hunched over in his pathetic and mutilated state and says, Wow, I can't wait to have a resurrection body like yours. <laughs> now, he would have said, Let's get you a doctor. You need help. As Strauss went on to say, There's no way that Jesus in his in the state could have convinced his disciples that he was the risen Lord of life. Alive, barely. Risen, no way. In summary, we can know that Jesus died by crucifixion because it is multiply attested by both Christian and non-Christian sources. The chances of surviving crucifixion were bleak, even under the best of conditions. The uniform professional medical opinion is that Jesus died, and Strauss's critique that says even if Jesus had survived, he couldn't have convinced his followers that he had been resurrected. Thus, given a strong evidence for Jesus' death by crucifixion, without good evidence to the contrary, the historian must conclude that Jesus was crucified and that the process killed him. Even the highly critical co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, John Dominic Crossan, concludes that Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. On three occasions in the same book, Crossan also asserts that this event resulted in his death. Now, in his online writings, Richard creates an elaborate theory of how Jesus could have survived crucifixion. But in the end, he admits a probability of better than 98% that Jesus died while on the cross. Thus, I think it is quite clear. Jesus was crucified, and it's most plausible to conclude that the process killed him. Fact number two, the empty tomb. That Jesus' tomb was empty is agreed on by an impressive 75% of all scholars writing on the subject. Let me give you three arguments for the empty tomb. First, the Jerusalem factor. Now, Jesus was publicly executed, buried, and then his resurrection was first proclaimed in Jerusalem. It would have been impossible for Christianity to get off the ground if the body had still been in the tomb. All the Roman or Jewish authorities would have had to do is go to the tomb, exhume the body, tie his ankles together, drag him through Main Street in Jerusalem, and the hoax was over. But there's no evidence whatsoever that that occurred. Second, Jesus' enemies attest to the empty tomb. 
Justin and Tertullian report that members of the Jewish leadership were claiming that the disciples of Jesus had stolen his body. This is outside corroboration of Matthew 28, 13, and seems to be an attempt to account for a missing body. If my 10-year-old son went in and told his fourth grade teacher that the dog ate his homework, well, that would be implying that he, wasn't, he didn't have it to turn in. And likewise, for you wouldn't claim that the body was stolen if it was still in the tomb. Paul Meyer, distinguished professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University, writes, Jewish polemics shared with Christians the conviction that the sepulcher was empty but gave natural explanations for it. And such positive evidence within a hostile source is the strongest kind of evidence and becomes self-authenticating. Third, the concept of resurrection up until and even past the time of Jesus was that it was a bodily event. The eminent New Testament historian N.T. Wright has demonstrated this carefully in his new 800-page volume on the resurrection. See, pagans disavowed resurrection because they believed they would become a disembodied spirit after death. Jews held a couple of views. They were, there were the Sadducees, who didn't believe in life after death. Rather, they held that when you died, that was it. No heaven. So they were sad, you see. <laughs> Most Jews held that resurrection meant that the body that died was buried and is the same body that will be raised and transformed into an immortal body. Now, of course, if it's being claimed that the body that had died had also been raised, this implies belief in an empty tomb. Without a body, you might have said that Jesus was still alive as he claimed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were still alive. But you wouldn't have said resurrection. And as we will see in a moment, that is precisely what the first Christians were proclaiming. So we see that there's good evidence for the empty tomb. The Jerusalem factor, it's witnessed by Jesus' enemies, and the concept of resurrection implies an empty tomb. The Jewish scholar Geza Vermesh writes, When every argument has been considered and weighed, the only conclusion acceptable to the historian must be that the women who set out to pay their last respects to Jesus found to their consternation not a body, but an empty tomb. So here's where we are. We've established not only that Jesus died, but that his tomb was empty. But wait, there's more. Fact number three. Something occurred that convinced a number of people, both friend and foe, that Jesus had been resurrected and had appeared to him. Nearly 100% again of all scholars who have studied the subject acknowledge this. Who were these people? I'd like to consider two categories, Jesus' friends and foes. First, Jesus' friends, his disciples. At least two people who knew the disciples, Paul and Clement of Rome, reported they were claiming Jesus had been resurrected and had appeared to them. Scholars have also identified what they call kerygma, from the Greek word kerygma, which means an official or formal proclamation. Thus, kerygma refers to the official and formal proclamation of the disciples or the first Christians. Kerygma is found in early traditions that predate the New Testament. Let me provide one of the main examples. That's found in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, or verses 3 through 7, that reads, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 at one time, most of whom are still alive, but some have died. After that, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And then Paul adds that he appeared to him too. Most scholars date this creed to within only a few years of Jesus' crucifixion and hold that it originated with the disciples. In fact, most hold that this list of appearances, with the exception of Paul, is the formal list that was proclaimed publicly by the disciples. I wish I had time to explain how scholars arrive at these conclusions because it's very interesting. I have to move on, but if Richard would like to question the conclusions of scholars on these points, I'd be happy to discuss it in the periods that follow. So we have the uniform testimonies of eyewitnesses and the earliest traditions that Jesus' disciples were claiming that he had been raised. But we can go further. At least seven sources in antiquity attest to their willingness to suffer and even die for this conviction. Now, of course, this doesn't prove their convictions were true, since people of other faiths are likewise willing to die for their convictions. However, it does indicate that they sincerely regarded their beliefs as being true. Liars make poor martyrs. So the original disciples not only claimed that the risen Jesus had appeared to them, they really believed it. The second category is Jesus' foes. It's very interesting that it wasn't just Jesus' followers who believed that he appeared to him, but also an enemy, Paul, 
Paul was a persecutor of the church or of Christians. He arrested them, beat them, had them executed for being Christians. Then he became one because he believed the risen Jesus had appeared to him. What evidence do we have for this? Well, Paul himself testifies to it. Luke confirms it. And uh, we also have a very early oral tradition that predates the New Testament and says, he who persecuted the church now proclaims the faith he once sought to destroy. So we have early eyewitness and multiple testimonies to this fact. fact. Folks, this is the type of evidence historians drool over. Paul's sufferings and martyrdom on behalf of the Gospels are reported by at least seven sources attesting to the sincerity of his belief to have seen the risen Jesus. In addition to Paul, we might add that the skeptic James, the brother of Jesus, converted to Christianity shortly after Jesus' crucifixion because he too believed that the risen Jesus had appeared to him. Most scholars note the embarrassing testimony of the Gospels is that Jesus' brothers, including James, were unbelievers during his ministry. So it's quite interesting when a number of sources identify him later as a leader in the Jerusalem church. Moreover, in spite of Jesus being dead, James' new belief that his brother was the Messiah was so strong that he died as a martyr for it. It seems the best explanation for this change is found in the early creed in 1 Corinthians, mentioned a few moments ago, that states, after that, he appeared to James. So we've seen that Jesus' resurrection was believed by his disciples and at least one, if not two, of his foes. The critical scholar Paula Fredrickson of Boston University comments, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say, and then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying they did, that they did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. But I do know that as a historian, that they must have seen something. Now let's build a case for, the, for Jesus' resurrection. I provided three major historical facts that are strongly evidenced and are widely accepted by scholars. Jesus' death by crucifixion, the empty tomb, and the beliefs of a number of people, both friend and foe, that he had been resurrected and had appeared to him, them. In historical investigation, it's very rare that something can be conducted with absolute or 100% certainty. Because of this, the historian looks for high probability, the best explanation of the facts. So what about Jesus' resurrection? Certainly, it explains all of the facts and does so easily and without strain. But can any natural explanation account for them just as well? Can I explain these using other hypotheses, given what we know from science, history, philosophy, and psychology? In my judgment, the answer is no. It's not just that these hypotheses cannot account for all of the facts. Most of the time, it's the facts themselves that serve as refutations of them. For example, if it's proposed that the disciples stole the body and lied about the appearances, this wouldn't account for the conversions of the church persecutor Paul or the skeptic James, who would have been the first to suspect fraud. Thus, when it comes to Jesus' resurrection, naturalistic theories do three things. Fail, fail, and fail. But what about the fact that we're talking about a miracle? Is historical investigation possible when a miracle is involved? In my opinion, yes. Historical events never stand as islands. All occur within a context. And the context in which these three facts occurred was charged with religious significance. At minimum, scholars have established that Jesus believed he had a uniquely intimate relationship with God, that he was God's chosen uh, servant to usher in his kingdom, that he performed deeds that many interpreted as miracles, and that he predicted his violent death and vindication of God. It is within this environment that the evidence for Jesus' resurrection occurs and thereby uh, greatly increases the probability of the event being a miracle rather than a result of natural causes. This is especially strengthened when we consider that natural explanations are extremely improbable and unimpressive when trying to account for the known data. In conclusion, we've seen that there's good evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Moreover, Jesus' resurrection explains all of the facts without any strain. Since positive evidence exists for Jesus' resurrection, in the absence of a more likely theory, we can conclude with confidence that Jesus' resurrection was an event that occurred in history. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to, uh, to present to you our second speaker, uh, who is a historian and philosopher whose articles have appeared in many publications, including the Skeptical Inquirer and the Secular Web. He has earned an MA in Arts 
of History at Columbia University and an MA of Philosophy in Ancient History and is currently working on his dissertation on Ancient Roman Science uh, at Columbia. His book, Sense and Goodness Without God, A Defense Without God, A Defense of Metaphysical Naturalism, is due out next year, along with an anthology titled Jesus is Dead, which includes three chapters by himself on the resurrection. He's been involved in online atheist-theist debates for over 10 years, has studied or reviewed numerous public debates, and has served as feedback editor and editor-in-chief of the secular web for many years. Uh, for Richard Carrier's online writings and links to his bio and homepage, you can go to infidels.org and all the things that are on that website. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Carrier. There are many theories contrary to what Mike has argued, but there isn't time tonight to look at them all. I will instead present the one theory I think is most probably correct, which I only have time to summarize. Shortly after the death of Jesus, his disciples prayed, meditated, and searched the scriptures for some meaning to justify the tragedy, and some way to preserve and promote the noble program of moral reform Jesus had died for. As a result, some had prophetic dreams or visions in which Jesus appeared to them, reassuring them and telling them just what they wanted to hear, that he had been raised by God so all who attached themselves to him and his moral program would participate in his resurrection as soon as this good news was preached to all Israel. The relevant content of this belief was that Jesus had been granted a new body by God, the resurrection body promised to all the faithful, abandoning his old body to the grave like a shell or husk to return to the dust from which it came. And this new, but the new body lived in heaven, from where Jesus would soon return on clouds of glory to give us our own new bodies at the end of days. Such, I believe, was the original belief. But the church quickly fragmented into competing sects with different agendas. And over the first century, some groups became more and more Gnostic, while others became more and more sarcissistic. Gnosticism gravitated to the view that only the soul of Jesus was exalted. Well, Sarcissism was the opposite view, that Jesus was raised only in the flesh, in the very same body that died and was buried. I believe both views are distortions of what the original Christians believed, yet both arose at roughly the same time and pace. Just as the Gnostics developed novel legends to explain and justify their view of things, so did the Sarcissists. The canonical Gospels represent the parables and legends adopted or developed to serve the Sarcissist program, and that was uh, the one and only sect to obtain total power and preserve for posterity its documents and its own version of history. That is my theory in rough outline. Now I have to explain why my theory is a better explanation of the facts than Mike's. There are nine facts that together establish that my theory is more probably correct. Number one, Paul contradicts the Gospels of Luke and John by describing a spiritual resurrection. This is significant because Paul's letters predate the writing of the Gospels and are the only sources recorded within 20 years of the death of Jesus. In addition, unlike the authors of the Gospels, Paul's name and identity is known to us with relative certainty, and he alone names his sources and confirms them as eyewitnesses. Therefore, what Paul says carries far more historical authority than the relatively anonymous documents written down decades later that relied on unnamed and unverified sources. Since the most relevant passage from 1 Corinthians 15 is so important, I will read an abridgment of it as I have translated from the Greek. But someone will say, how are the dead raised, and with what kind of body do they come? You idiot, what you sow is not given life unless it dies, and what you sow you do not sow the body that will come to be, but a naked seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body, just as he pleased, and to each of the seeds he gives a body all its own. Not all flesh is the same flesh, but there is one sort of flesh for men, another flesh for cattle, another flesh for birds, and another for fish. There are also bodies in heaven and bodies on earth, but the glory of the heavenly ones is beyond the glory of the earthly ones. There is one glory for the sun, another glory for the moon, etc. So also is the resurrection of the dead. A natural body is sown, but a spiritual body is raised. So also is it written, the first man, Adam, turned into a living life form, but the last Adam into a life-giving spirit. 
But the spiritual body is not first. Rather, first comes the natural body, then the spiritual body. The first man is made of dust from the earth. The second man is made of something from heaven. As is the one of dust, so also are those of dust. And as is the one in heaven, so also are those in heaven. And just as we once wore the image of the one of dust, let us also come to wear the image of the one in heaven. I say this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot receive the kingdom of God, nor does decay receive indestructibility. Look, I tell you a mystery. Not all of us will fall asleep, but we'll all be changed in an instant, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. That is what Paul wrote roughly 20 years after the death of Jesus. Note that Paul explicitly says the resurrected Jesus was a spirit, and that flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom. In fact, earlier, Paul had even said that our resurrected body will not have a stomach and so will not eat food. And here he adds that it will be completely indestructible. That's what Paul says, and that is clearly how he understood the resurrection to be. Yet this contradicts what Luke and John say. Luke claims that Christ said, A spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And then he eats some fish to prove it. John claims the resurrected body of Jesus was still wounded, which cannot be if it was indestructible. So from Paul we learn that Jesus was a spirit, and had no stomach, and thus wouldn't eat, that his body could not be blemished, and that it did not consist of flesh or blood, but of some spiritual heavenly substance. Yet Luke and John claim Jesus did eat, did have blemishes, did consist of flesh and blood, and was not a spirit. Our earliest and most reliable record says one thing, and our later record says exactly the opposite. One of them must be wrong. And most likely, it's the later, less secure sources that have it wrong. Number two, Paul omits these very crucial claims of Luke and John. It is more probable that those claims were contrived after Paul's time, than that they existed at the very origin of the church, and yet Paul had never heard of them. Since his discussion here in 1 Corinthians discern, concerned answering questions about the nature of the resurrection body, it is hardly conceivable that Paul would fail to cite the most powerful and relevant evidence, physical eyewitness encounters revealing exactly what that body was like. Number three, Paul declares that Christ's resurrection was just like ours will be, but he describes our resurrection in terms that can only be understood as exchanging one body for another, not changing the same body into something else. Paul explicitly says, the body that dies is not the body that will rise, but God provides its own body. Paul takes great pains to explain that there are many different bodies, especially between bodies in heaven and on earth, and that our new bodies will be spiritual bodies, composed of the same stuff of the glorious stars. Paul goes out of his way to assert that the spiritual body comes after the natural body that dies. In all this, he specifically avoids ever simply saying that the natural body will become a spiritual body. He doesn't say that. His whole discourse emphasizes difference in substance and origin. Dust belongs to the earth. Spirit belongs to heaven. It follows that the body of dust must be left behind, that this is the only way to enter the heavenly realm of the indestructible. As Paul says, we will put on our new bodies like new coats, suggesting the old coat will be left behind. In fact, in Paul's phrase, we'll all be changed, he uses the Greek word alagesamatha, which does not mean change in the sense of changing one thing into another, but is instead the verb of mercantile exchange, of trading one thing for another. This two-body doctrine was the view held by the Essene Jews, the one sect that had the most in common with the early Christian church. And it was also held by a prominent first century Jew, Josephus, a Pharisee who specifically explains that our current bodies are inevitably corruptible and must return to the earth from which they came. So God will give us new, better bodies and in the resurrection. Philo, another Jew and a contemporary of Paul, also held to a similar view. And Josephus and Philo often use the very same concepts and language as Paul. Thus, there is a good probability that Paul shared their view and understood the resurrection just as they did, as an exchange of an old shell of a body for a new heavenly body. This would explain one peculiar fact about the letters of Paul, why he never once mentions the empty tomb, or any details of the empty tomb story. Because the tomb wasn't empty, rather the corpse was empty, for the spirit of Jesus had been transported into a new body in heaven, just as Josephus, Philo, and the Essenes all believed would happen, and just as Paul seems to have described. Now, later stories in the Gospels about an empty tomb and appearances are the only evidence Mike has against my theory. 
But my theory is based on earlier and more reliable evidence, has precedence in early Jewish thought, and already has the greater probability. It is the best and simplest explanation for what Paul both says and doesn't say. But there is more evidence that the empty tomb story is, more probably than not, a legend, which probably began as a literary symbol and not a claim to historical fact, and that the original appearances were more probably than not ordinary religious visions, later embellished to support the Sarcissist dogma. So now to those facts. Number four. Throughout history, we have found that the frequency of amazing but true stories is low, very low. Such stories are rare, while the frequency of myths, legends, and tall tales is very high. Such stories are common. It follows that the probability that any amazing story will be false is higher than the probability it will be true. That doesn't mean every amazing story is false, only that this is more likely. Nor does this mean that we can never prove an amazing story true, uh, it, only that we need especially strong evidence to overcome their low probability. In contrast, my theory rests on what is already the most probable, given what we know about history in general. Number five, there is insufficient evidence to overcome the low probability that the empty tomb story is true. Being an amazing story, it is already likely to be false. To prove it is not, we need some good evidence. But the evidence we have is not at all good, in fact, it is among the worst we can have for any historical claim. There are five kinds of evidence we can have in history, and the more and better evidence we have from this list, the more certain we can be that a claim is true. Uh, as an example, I will compare the claim that the tomb of Jesus was found empty with the claim that Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon. First, the physical historical necessity of this event is exceedingly great. The history of Rome could not have proceeded as it did had Caesar not physically moved an army into Italy. He could not have captured Rome or conscripted Italian men against Pompey's forces in Greece. In contrast, the discovery of an empty tomb is not necessary, for as we have seen, the original belief may well have been that Jesus switched bodies and appeared in visions. That would be sufficient to get the religion started. Thus, an empty tomb is not necessary to explain all subsequent history, unlike Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon. Second, in Caesar's case, we have lots of direct physical evidence. We have a number of inscriptions and coins produced soon after the Republican Civil War related to the Rubicon crossing. In contrast, we have no physical evidence of any kind supporting the empty tomb. No papyri survive and no inscriptions were commissioned by the resurrected Jesus or by the early church or by witnesses like Peter or Joseph of Arimathea. Third, for Caesar, we have unbiased corroboration even Caesar's enemies, like Cicero, reported the crossing of the Rubicon, as did other hostile or neutral observers. Whereas we have no hostile or even neutral records of an empty tomb by any non-Christian until well after the Christians started telling the story, after Paul's death, and long after any facts could be checked. Fourth, we have several crit credible, critical accounts of the Rubicon crossing by known scholars of the time, Suetonius, Appian, Cassius Dio, Plutarch. And we know a lot about who they were and their scholarship. They often quote and name many different sources, showing a wide reading of witnesses and documents. And they critically examine several disputed claims. They also cite or quote texts written by witnesses and contemporaries, hostile and friendly, of the Rubicon crossing and its repercussions. In contrast, we have not even a single skilled historian mentioning the empty tomb until centuries after the fact. While of those who mention the empty tomb within the first century, None show any wide reading, never name any sources, show no sign of a skilled or critical examination of conflicting claims, have no detailed scholarship to their credit that we can test for their skill and accuracy, are essentially unknown, and have an overtly declared bias towards persuasion and conversion. Fifth, there is an eyewitness account, for we have Caesar's own word on the subject. Indeed, the book, The Civil War, has been a Latin classic for 2,000 years. In contrast, we have nothing written by Jesus nor any record of the empty tomb by eyewitnesses like Peter. And we do not know for certain the name or identity of any author of any of the accounts of the empty tomb that we do have, much less the name of any of their immediate sources. It should be clear that we have many reasons to believe Caesar crossed the Rubicon, all of which are lacking in the case of the empty tomb. In fact, when we compare all five points, we see that in four of them, the empty tomb has no evidence at all, and in the one proof that it does have, it has not the best, but the very worst kind of evidence, a handful of late, biased, uncritical, unscholarly, unknown, second-hand witnesses. That's not good evidence. 
even seen in the best possible light, the evidence available is simply not sufficient to establish that there really was an empty tomb. Number six, the Gospels themselves show signs of an increasing rate of legendary development. ...of newfangled Gospels containing false claims, including myths and clever fabrications. We should certainly expect this only grew worse after Paul's day, when our Gospels were finally written. The first Gospel, Mark, tells a simple story about women going to the tomb and finding it open, meeting a single boy in white, then running off. The whole account is probably a parable and never intended to be read as history. But in the Gospel of Matthew, which simply borrowed from Mark and added to it, the boy has become an angel descending from heaven. The women experience a massive earthquake and watch the angel descend and see it open the tomb. Guards have been added to the story, and the women run off but now get to meet Jesus on the way. Can we doubt that we are looking at extensive legendary embellishment upon what began as a much more mundane story? We can see the same trend in Luke. Mark's one boy in white has been multiplied into two men who suddenly appear in dazzling apparel. Now we hear that Peter went to check the tomb and confirmed it was empty. And Jesus appears in the flesh and invites his disciples to touch him and eats fish to prove he's real, then whooshes up into heaven before their very eyes. That again sounds like a pretty fancy embellishment of Mark's far more humble story. In John, Jesus receives an absurdly fabulous burial. Peter again goes to see for himself, but this time yet another disciple goes too. Luke's two men now become two angels, and we get the elaborate tale of the doubting Thomas putting his fingers inside the wounds on Christ's body, and Jesus declaring, Blessed are they who believe without seeing. All this certainly looks like a growing legend. Number seven, we have found that genuine supernatural encounters must be extraordinarily rare, since despite 200 years of detailed scientific investigation, we have yet to confirm a single genuine case. In contrast, across the whole spectrum of human history and culture, inspiring religious dreams and hallucinations are quite common. Indeed, they are most frequent in cultures that elevate the status of such experiences, like the ancient world. And we have numerous examples of powerful dreams and hallucinations of pagan deities. We have also established the psychological and neurophysical basis of religious hallucination. It follows that the probability any appearance of God will really be a dream or hallucination is much higher than the probability of a genuine encounter with God. That doesn't mean every such encounter is false, only that this is more likely. Nor does this mean that we can never prove such an encounter genuine, only that we need especially strong evidence to overcome its low probability. In contrast, my theory rests on what is already the most probable given what we know about human nature, the human brain, and the history of religions and ancient culture. Number eight, Paul describes the appearances of Jesus in terms more consistent with a vision than a physical body. He places himself on the list of witnesses to the risen Christ along with Peter, James, and everyone else. And in Paul's letter to the Galatians, he says, I neither received the gospel from a man, nor was I taught it, except through a revelation of Jesus Christ. A revelation, he specifically says, was not an encounter with flesh and blood. And the book of Acts describes Paul's experience as a vision, just a light and a voice, commonplace features of hallucination. That our earliest and best evidence would be of this character, while the only evidence of a more physical encounter with Jesus comes much later from much less secure sources, is more probable if the original experiences were in fact like Paul's vision and less probable if they were like what some Gospels strive to depict. Number nine, Mark and Matthew don't mention Jesus appearing in the flesh, and Luke and John share the detail that Jesus suddenly appeared and disappeared on some occasions, as one would expect of a vision, and on other occasions appeared as someone else whose face no one recognized, which was a common motif in ancient religion, the god or angel appearing in disguise to test us. In contrast, details supporting a resurrection of the flesh arise only in Luke, and then appear in John, who is not an independent source since he borrowed many unique scenes from Luke. That our only evidence for a resurrection of the flesh would be entirely traceable to only one source, which we know came later than, and embellished upon, a source excluding those details, is more probable if it's a late fabrication, and less probable if it was part of the original tradition. So those are the nine facts that support my theory more than Mike's. There's a lot more, but I've outlined the main reasons for believing as I do.
That we would have those facts rather than others is more probable if my theory is true and less probable if Mike's theory is true. So the theory that visions inspired a belief that Jesus had been transported into the new heavenly body of the promised resurrection fits all nine facts better than any other theory. Now, obviously, we can construct some elaborate hypothesis to explain away all this evidence, but my explanation will still remain the simplest and thus the most probable, the one most loyal to what Paul himself says, and the one most consistent with known probabilities and all the actual facts of history. Thank you. So we proceed according to plan. Uh, now Mike Lacona has 10 minutes uh, to respond to what he's just heard. <laughs> Thank you, Richard, for that opening statement. Richard and I agreed to exchange our opening statements a few weeks ago in order to provide a more focused and interesting debate. Thus, we've had some time to prepare our first rebuttals. Let me recap my argument for Jesus' resurrection. I presented three historical facts that are strongly evidenced and widely accepted by the large majority of scholars. Jesus' death by crucifixion, the empty tomb, and the beliefs of a number of people, both friend and foe, that Jesus had been resurrected and had appeared to them. I provided evidence for all of these and argued that Jesus' resurrection is the best explanation for those facts because it accounts for all of the facts, does so easily and without strain. I also pointed out that when all natural theories fail, or are less likely than the resurrection, we're justified in concluding that a miracle has occurred when the data appear in a context charged with religious significance. I further showed that such a context exists with Jesus' resurrection and therefore significantly increases the probability of a miracle. Now let's look at Richard's theory. He grants that Jesus died and that the disciples had genuine experiences that they interpreted as being the risen Jesus. However, he holds that these can be accounted for by hallucinations or dreams. He also holds that the empty tomb is the result of later legendary development. He then presented nine arguments to support it. Since I only have ten minutes to reply, and since some of his arguments are repetitious, I'm going to categorize his nine objections into three areas and address these. First, the first category is his philosophical objections. His fourth and seventh objections are nearly identical and concern frequency, probability, he says, myths, hallucinations, and dreams are more frequent than amazing but true stories or genuine supernatural encounters. Thus, he says, there's a greater probability that what we have here are myths, hallucinations, and dreams. But probabilities of this sort uh, only work when blind processes are involved. They don't work if there is intention behind it. For example, your chances of losing the lottery are much greater than your chances of winning. However, if I re re rig the lottery so that your number will come up, your chances of winning become greater than your chances of losing. Thus, if a context exists where there's reason to believe God may want to act, the chances that we have a genuine miracle in our hands may be greater than they are for myth, dream, or hallucination, especially if other data point away from these, as they do. The prominent atheist philosopher Antony Flew comments, certainly, given some beliefs about God, the occurrence of the resurrection does become enormously more probable. His fifth argument is that the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is insufficient to overcome the low probability of a supernatural or amazing but true event. Not at all. We've already seen that frequency probability doesn't work when intentionality is present. Moreover, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is good, contrary to Richard's claim that it is of the worst sort. His comparison with Caesar's crossing the Rubicon is seriously flawed and downright inaccurate on many of the things he said. For example, he speaks of the credibility of the Roman historians over the Gospels. Yet, classical historian A. N. Sherwin White of Oxford writes that the Roman historians disagree amongst themselves in the wildest possible fashion, both in major matters and in specific details. Sherwin White adds that the Roman historians are no better than the Gospels. Now, I don't have time to address this further in this rebuttal, but I hope to bring it up in my next one. Richard says we need especially strong evidence to overcome low probability. I believe we have such evidence for Jesus' resurrection. But the requirement of especially strong evidence to overcome low probability cuts both ways. Remember, he proposed hallucinations or dreams. His theory requires group hallucinations, which most psychologists agree are impossible, and hallucinations experienced by his enemies who are unlikely to have been in the frame of mind to hallucinate. All of this makes his theory very improbable as well as ad hoc. 
Thus, by his own criteria, he's going to need extraordinary evidence to support his extraordinary claims. The second category involves his criticisms of the Gospels. His sixth and ninth arguments concern details in them. Now, I'd be happy to address these later, but because I'm pressed for time, for now I'll simply point out that this argument is entirely moot, since virtually all of the evidence I provided is from Paul and the Kerygma, data that predate the Gospels by decades. The third category of his objections relate to Paul. His first, second, third, and eighth arguments have to do with Paul's interpretation of what happened to Jesus. He went to 1 Corinthians 15 and argued that Paul held that when Christians die, they exchange their old bodies for a new one, a spiritual one. On the other hand, I've proposed the orthodox view, which states that the body that is buried is the same body that will be raised and transformed into an immortal body. Did Paul support Richard's exchange theory or the orthodox transformation view? Well, I'm going to go through the same passage quickly. We'll look carefully at the Greek and we'll see where Richard clearly misunderstands Paul at numerous and crucial points. In this passage, Paul is answering the question, what will our future bodies be like? He starts off by saying, so is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown, it is raised. When Paul says, so is the resurrection of the dead, the dead is in the plural in Greek. In other words, the dead ones are those who have died. But the very next term is in the singular. It is sown. It is raised. He's referring to our present, and, our present body, and there's continuity. In other words, what goes down in burial comes up in resurrection. It's a transformation, not an exchange. Paul says, it is sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual body. Richard interprets the meaning of the Greek word for spiritual, pneumatikos, as something of a different substance, a heavenly substance. Would you like to know how many times this Greek word refers to the material makeup of something as Richard holds? Zero. With the lone possible exception of Ephesians 6.12, which isn't clear, it never appears in that sense, at least not in Paul or the New Testament. This is easily discovered or checked with the precision using a premier software program like BibleWorks. Now, we're fortunate that Paul uses the same two words for natural and spiritual earlier in the same letter. In chapter 2, verse 14, he says, The natural man does not accept the things that come from God because they are spiritually discerned. Here, Paul mentions the natural man or those governed by their fleshly and sinful desires with spiritual truths, holy, pure, and related to God. Thus, later in chapter 15, Paul is saying that our current body is sown with all of its fleshly and sinful desires and raised with holy, pure, and desires centered on God. There's nothing here in support of an interpretation that refers to a different bodily makeup. Thus, the exchange theory is not supported here either. In the next verse, Paul refers to Adam as a living soul and Jesus as a life-giving spirit. The words Paul used for soul and spirit are the roots for the same two words we just discussed. This rules out any hopes of interpreting Paul as suggesting a different material makeup of the body. Moreover, the word for life-giving, zoopoieo, is used by Paul in Romans 8.11 where he says, The Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life, zoopoieo, to your mortal bodies. Notice Paul says the life-giving Spirit will give life to our mortal bodies. Since Paul uses the same Greek word on the same subject of our future bodies, it is clear that transformation is meant, not an exchange. Richard objects that in verse 50, Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And in doing so, contradicts Luke, who has Jesus saying, a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. But here again, he has failed to grasp the linguistics of the passage. Greek exegete D.A. Carson notes that the term flesh and blood was a common Jewish expression referring to man as a mortal being. A Bible work search reveals that the term appears five times in the New Testament and twice in intertestamental writings, all with the meaning of being mortal. Thus, Paul is not at all contradicting Luke. And once again, there is nothing here hinting at an exchange. Finally, Richard says that in um, verses 51 and 52, Paul uses the term um, allegasamatha, which does not mean change in the sense of changing one thing into another thing, I'm quoting him, but is instead the verb of mercantile exchange, of trading one thing for another. Folks, this is a half-truth, and the wrong half. 
All anyone has to do is go to the major Greek lexicons such as Liddell Scott, BDAG, and Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, and you'll discover, contrary to Richard's claim, that the primary meaning of the term is to change, to alter. The mercantile definition of trading one thing for another is a secondary definition. In fact, BDAG and TDNT list 1 Corinthians 15 under the primary definition of altering. Liddell Scott is silent on the verse. In conclusion, we've seen that the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is very good, and Richard's arguments fail, leaving him without a perch on which to roost. His theory is far from being simple, omits important considerations in his philosophical arguments, contains numerous and major inaccuracies, strains the Greek in order to accommodate him, is ad hoc, and has less explanatory power than the theory that Jesus rose, and therefore should be rejected. Thank you. And now for Carrier's first rebuttal. Thank you. I agree with Mike on two of his three facts. Probably Jesus died, and then probably his most ardent followers sincerely believed they had seen him. But I do not agree we have good evidence there was an empty tomb. First, Mike's Jerusalem factor carries no weight against my theory, since I have given you several good reasons to think the original Christians did not believe the tomb was empty, but that the corpse was empty of the spirit of Jesus which had poured itself into a completely new body in, he in heaven. The Jews or Romans could not respond to such a claim by pointing to the old body. Second, Mike is correct that most Jews only regarded as a resurrection a bodily event, but that is also irrelevant. Since I am arguing that it was indeed believed to be a bodily event, it just didn't involve the body in the tomb. And third, Mike is incorrect when he says that Jesus' enemies attest to the empty tomb. We do not have a single document by any enemy of Christianity uh, from the first century even alluding to an empty tomb. All we have is a claim by a single Christian, Matthew. And I'm pretty sure that Matthew made that up. I'll say more on these points presently. But first, I pause to address an issue I hadn't, didn't have time to explore in my opening, which is why Paul converted. As to the disciples and any family members who would be shattered by the terrible death of Jesus, I believe a series of grief-induced hallucinations strongly inspired by religious fervor, fatigue, stress, or fasting, and the contemplation of things Jesus said and the searching of hidden meanings in Scripture to make some sense of the tragedy could all have conspired to produce an affirming experience of a vindicated Jesus. There is nothing peculiar in such events involving groups. Several cases have been documented. Suggestion and memory contamination are well understood. Though all may have been seeing something different, all would believe they were seeing the same thing, only in their own way, especially if there was a strong leader guiding them in their interpretation of what was happening. I could say a lot more about this, but my time is short. The main question is why Paul would have such an experience, since he was not inspired by grief at the death of Jesus. First, I should point out that this is exactly why Paul is unique, because his inspiring circumstances were unique. If God were really appearing to people, there is hardly any credible reason why he would appear to only to one persecutor rather than to all of them, or at least a lot of them. But if Paul's experience were natural rather than divine, then we should expect such an event to be rare, possibly even unique, and lo and behold, that appears to be the case. This point carries for the disciples, too. It is extremely improbable that a genuinely divine Jesus would appear to only a few people in only one tiny place and only one brief time. It is far more probable he would have appeared to everyone at all times, or at the very least, everyone who could be saved. That the religion began with private visions granted only to a privileged few in a time and culture where this was common is more consistent with it beginning like every other visionary religion, as a natural product of human culture, psychology, and physiology. As to what actually happened to Paul, we know very little, which leaves a lot of room for speculation. I believe Paul came to feel guilt at what he was doing to the Christians, which became all the more painful to him when he started to find the Christian teaching appealing, especially its social program of moral reform. I argue in a forthcoming article of the Journal of Higher Criticism why this program was very appealing, even to outsiders like Paul. But to join this movement for a better society, Paul had to convert. The stress from worrying how to rationalize joining this program, and from his guilt at having treated so horribly those with such noble intentions, 
and the ensuing fatigue of losing sleep over this and traveling on a long, desolate road could easily have conspired, in his case, to induce an affirming hallucination, his subconscious mind producing for him the very thing he most wanted, a sincere motive to repent and become a leader rather than a persecutor of the movement he'd come to admire. So I see no difficulty in appealing to ordinary religious hallucination. My theory agrees with what we know about the neurophysics, the psychology, and the anthropology of religious experience throughout the world, and it does not contradict anything we read from Paul himself. That said, I'd like to return to the two points I made earlier. First, Josephus, who, like Paul, was a Pharisee, wrote that, The bodies of all men are truly mortal. They are created out of corruptible matter. But the soul is forever immortal, and is a part of God that inhabits our bodies. When people exit this life, then the souls that remain pure and obedient obtain from God the holiest place in heaven, and from there, after the completion of the ages, once again, they are sent instead into pristine bodies. Elsewhere, Josephus says, God has granted that we be recreated and get a better life after the revolution. And in another passage, he explains, the Pharisees say that though every soul is incorruptible, only the soul of good men crosses over into another body. There can be no mistaking what Josephus is saying. We will get completely new bodies in the resurrection, for our present bodies can do nothing but return to dust. The doctrine of Philo and the Essene Jews was more complicated, but it amounts to nearly the same view. And Paul uses the same kind of language as they do, not only in 1 Corinthians 15, but elsewhere. In Philippians, for example, Paul does not say our bodies will change. He says God will change the form of our bodies to share the same form of Christ's body. And he uses the same word Josephus sometimes uses to refer to changing clothes. And in the same passage, Paul says our place of citizenship exists in the heavens while our present, body, our present body belongs to a lowly state. The exact same ideas are found in Philo and the Essenes. Then, in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed. Because the things that can be seen are temporary, it's the things that can't be seen that are eternal. So Paul says the body we see is not eternal, only the spiritual body, which we can't yet see, is eternal. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, We know that if our earthly house of a body is torn down, we have a building from God, a house made without hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in our present body we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. And if we do get undressed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in the body, we groan because we are weighed down. And for this reason, we do not want to undress, but to put something on, so what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. This is quite explicit. Our earthly body will be torn down and taken away, and we will be given a new heavenly body. And everything Paul says here is almost exactly what, the, what Philo and the Essenes say. The clincher is this. Mike cites N.T. Wright's monumental treatise on this subject, but evidently Mike didn't read it. I quote from that very book. Wright says, It is no doubt right that Paul can envisage here the possibility of exchange, losing one body, getting another one, rather than addition. Two of the greatest Christian scholars in antiquity agreed, Origen and John Philippon. Today, several experts share this view. C.F.C. Moule, Gregory Riley, Dale Martin, Adela Collins, Peter Lamp. So my theory is more than plausible. Then there is the accusation of theft. Peculiar verbal and structural clues in Matthew's narrative prove that Matthew transformed Mark's narrative into a new version of the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Making that parallel fit required the placing of a seal on the tomb to match the placing of a seal on Daniel's den. And the placing of a seal required the placing of guards, and the placing of guards requires an accusation of theft. We can know this is all fiction because none of the other gospel accounts of the empty tomb make the presence of guards at all possible. And no other document independent of Matthew ever mentions the claim. Not even Acts, despite the fact it depicts numerous Jewish attacks against the nascent church, so it is most peculiar that Luke had never heard of their accusation of theft. Most peculiar of all, in actual Jewish documents, only the legitimacy of Jesus is challenged. The most biting Jewish polemic in the Talmud hugely contradicts the gospel accounts of the trial of Jesus, and yet still they saw no need to counter the claim of an empty tomb. That's just bizarre, unless there was no such claim to counter. We might also add that in Jewish legend, 
the Roman general Titus cast a necromantic spell to summon the spirit of Jesus for questioning. We happen to know such a spell required the skull of the deceased, which entails the Jews believed, at least, the skull of Jesus was available, which suggests they did not believe the tomb was empty. Finally, I believe Mark invented the empty tomb story as a symbolic parable and not a claim to historical fact. Mark says Jesus declare, declared, I will destroy this holy residence made by hands and in three days build another house not made by hands, clearly referring to his resurrection. Yet he says he will not raise the same body but build a new one not made by hands, exactly as Paul said. So Mark doesn't really believe the tomb was empty. He only uses it as a metaphor. I have several good reasons for believing this, which unfortunately I haven't time to ex explain right now. But many of Mike's objections, such as why Mark has women finding the tomb instead of men, uh, are required by Mark's mythic structure. For example, it fulfills the prediction of Jesus that the least shall be first. Thank you. Once again, uh, Michael Connor. Thanks. In Richard's first rebuttal, he said that he agreed with that Jesus died and that his believers uh, were convinced that they saw him. He attacked, but he doesn't believe in the empty tomb. He says the Jerusalem factor that I uh, presented carries no weight because he showed that the Jews didn't believe resurrection. Well, I, I don't think he did that. Um, he tried to show that Paul didn't believe in resurrection, but we showed that he was flawed in the way he said that because of his misunderstanding of the Greek and, and Paul at very specific and crucial points. Well, he says um, uh, uh, that uh, there were no enemy documents to the empty tomb, and thus we couldn't use enemy attested. Well, uh, he says that, uh, in fact, he thinks it's only in Matthew and that Matthew made it up. Well, I'd like to know where his evidence is for that. He didn't provide any. He just made an unsupported, unsubstantiated claim. Sure, he just made it up. Let's not provide any evidence. Then he said, well, the disciples um, um, uh, experienced grief hallucination. Well, this doesn't account for the empty tomb, which I said I think is strongly supported. And it is largely acknowledged by scholarship today, an impressive 75%. If they were experiencing grief hallucinations, it wouldn't account for the appearances to the skeptic James, who wouldn't have been grieving, and it wouldn't account to the, um, for Paul, who wouldn't have been grieving either. Well, he said, yeah, but Paul uh, was guilty. He felt guilty about what he was doing. Well, there's no evidence for that either. In fact, Paul seemed to be proud of his resume that's presented in Philippians chapter 2. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, he said. Well, then he says, well, it's, it's improbable that Jesus appeared to only a few. Well, how does he know that? Well, what kind of probability calculus is he basing that theory upon? Um, how does he know why Jesus would only appear to that? The fact is that Jesus appeared to people, uh, at least uh, people who were his followers did, a number of them did, to both individuals and groups, and he appeared to one enemy, at least, and probably even a skeptic. Well, then he mentions... Um, um, Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.14, and he said uh, that Paul had this exchange in mind, and he said, well, I probably didn't even read N.T. Wright's book. Well, I did, and, and I would encourage Richard to go back to that passage because um, N.T. Wright in that very passage says it's very tough, and, and scholars disagree almost down the line, 50-50, on what Paul is, is really saying here. And he quotes Martin Hengel, if I recall properly. It's been about a, uh, six, seven, nine months since I've, or July, last July since I read the book. But um, he, I think he quotes Martin Hengel as saying it's just really difficult and scholars really disagree on this passage and what it's really saying. But he goes on to say that Paul had, we need not think that Paul was referring to the spiritual body, and here's why. We showed very definitely that Paul was referring to a bodily resurrection, a transformation, not an exchange, in 1 Corinthians 15. Even if Richard was right here in his interpretation that he's, not, that he's talking more of an ethereal body in 2 Corinthians, just one year later, Paul writes Romans, which he's very specifically in Romans 8.11, talks about bodily resurrection of the same body. Remember, the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life, zoio poiao, to your mortal bodies. There's no question that transformation is what is being referred to here. Well, he quotes uh, Josephus there. Yeah, I admit that Josephus, this passage is tough, 
but he doesn't say resurrection here either. He's just saying that this was his view of what happened in the afterlife. Now, I contacted Louis Feldman on this. Louis Feldman is perhaps the greatest uh, living Josephus scholar today, and he's a Jewish scholar. And jo um, Feldman wrote me back and, and said that, and I quote, this passage does not seem to me to talk about, I'm sorry, this passage does seem to me to talk about reincarnation in a new body. Though he deals with Daniel at length, he does not refer to Daniel 12, 1 through 3, which speaks of resurrection. I wonder about this because in Life 12, he identifies politically with the Pharisees, who certainly in the Talmud, Mishnah Sanhedrin 10, 1, regard the belief in resurrection as a cornerstone of Judaism. Perhaps he believed in both reincarnation and resurrection. Besides, the whole thing is moot what Josephus and Philo and the Essenes believed. We know that the Jews had a number of different beliefs regarding the afterlife. I pointed that out in my opening statement. Remember the Sadducees. They didn't believe in resurrection at all. They just believed that when you died, that was it. The question is, what did the earliest Christians believe? And we see very clearly from the earliest Christian writer, Paul, that they believed in resurrection of the same body. It was a transformation. This is further confirmed in the very passage which Richard quoted from Paul, Philippians 3.21, where it says, um, We eagerly wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform. The word transform is used there. It's not a changing of clothes. It's a transformation. Um, who will transform. What's he going to transform? Our lowly, humble bodies into conformity with his glorious body. Again, it's not an exchange. It's a transformation. Well, then he talked about, he said, uh, the guards. He says, well, I, I don't think that this is authentic. Well, there are some good arguments that for a Jewish polemic here, Jewish Christian polemic that says, um, Jesus rose from the dead, Jewish response. No, the disciples stole the body, Christian response. Uh, they couldn't have because the guards at the tomb, Jewish response. No, the guards fell asleep, Christian response. No, the chief priest paid them to say that. And so when you look at this, we can see that perhaps there is some good evidence for the guards there. Besides, my... my um, uh, argument didn't rest on the guards anyway. He said, well, the Talmud contradicts the Gospels on Jesus. Well, the Talmud is late. It's hundreds of years after Jesus. And most believe, uh, even Jewish historians, that we, we this is just a polemic against the Christians of those days. It's not trying to accurately report the historical Jesus. Well, he says, Mark invented the empty tomb as a parallel, and it's not a historical fact at all. Well, I believe he's taking this because from Dennis MacDonald in his book, The Homeric Ep Epics in the Gospel of Mark, which he writes on and endorses online. But this view is both irrelevant and wrong. It's irrelevant because Mark is decades later than the oral tradition in Paul that I quoted, which comes decades before. It's wrong because many times MacDonald has to strain and contort the text to find his parallels, especially when he comes to the death, burial, and resurrection. For example, in the Iliad, Hector's body is burned and his tomb holds his remains forever, while Jesus' body is resurrected three days later. Resurrection is mentioned three times in the Iliad, twice regarding its impossibility and once in the metaphor of Hector's avoidance of certain death. Mark differs in a million ways from Homer. In fact, in order to account for this, MacDonald claims that Mark, and I quote, Mark hid his dependence by avoiding Homeric vocabulary, transforming characterizations, motifs, and episodes, placing the episodes out of sequence, and employing multiple literary models, especially from Jewish scriptures, end quote, page 170. In other words, MacDonald is claiming that all of the characteristics the historian would look for in order to show a borrowing are absent because Mark changed everything intentionally in order to keep from being detected. Well, using this kind of answer, um, we might accuse any author of copying from any other author of our choice. Are we surprised to find then that MacDonald's thesis has not gained much of a following? In fact, the um, Robert Rabble, the professor of Greek and Roman history uh, literature at the University of Kentucky comments that one can discern literally hundreds of close parallels between the Iliad and, say, Clint Eastwood's movie, Unforgiven. So we've seen that these failed. I got two minutes left. Let me uh, see if I can touch on this Rubicon comparison real quickly, and I'll take the more important points. He says that we have direct physical evidence for Caesar's crossing the Rubicon, such as inscriptions and coins. Yet he says there's nothing of the sort for Jesus' resurrection. Well, we have an empty tomb. We have documents written by even enemies. Well, coins would be nice, but since the Roman Empire was killing Christians at that time, I don't think we can expect a commemorative coin set in, uh, in honor of Jesus. Moreover, if he rose from the dead, we wouldn't find bones or a bone box. I don't know what else he wants, a photo? 
Well, if the Shroud of Turin is authentic, we have that too. He says, Caesar, we have unbiased corroboration, since even his enemies, Cicero, reported the event. Well, we have two enemies, Paul and James, who reported a post-mortem appearance of Jesus to them. And Paul was certainly more hostile toward Christians than Cicero was to Caesar. Well, he mentions bias. Well, bias doesn't mean false information. In one of his articles, Richard refers to religion as socially acceptable insanity. That's clear bias against religion. Should we therefore reject everything he's saying here this evening? I don't think so. We simply need to be aware of the bias of the writer, and for our own for that part, and then proceed with caution. He says that several credible accounts of the Rubicon event by known scholars of the time, whereas no one historian reports the resurrection of Jesus. First, Richard underestimates the reliability of the Gospels. The historical accuracy of Luke and John have many times been corroborated by archaeological finds. He also overestimates the greatness of the Roman historians he cites. For example, Suetonius is indiscriminate in his use of sources. Plutarch is inaccurate at times and makes frequent use of anecdotal material, such as when he said that, said that Alexander the Great descended from Hercules. Appian is known for his many inaccuracies. Cassius Dio contradicts himself as well as embellishes changes and combines facts in order to be more dramatic. Pliny the Younger, just a few um, pages after one of the works that uh, Richard quotes, mentions dog-headed apes. Uh, five-year-old girls who give uh, birth, a woman who gave birth to an elephant, 12 uh, feet tall Ethiopians. These are the sources he's appealing to and say they're very credible over the Gospels. Moreover, all the Roman historians write 150 to 250 years after Caesar's crossing the Rubicon, whereas the reports of Jesus' resurrection start within five years of the event. Even the Gospels by critical dating are only 40 to 70 years later. So, I don't think that we have some problems here with the Gospels. I think we still have good re reason to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, just as we find in the earliest multiple enemy and embarrassing sources. Thank you. So our first speaker is a New Testament historian who has a Master of Arts degree in Religious Studies uh, from Liberty University and is now a PhD candidate in New Testament studies at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He is a member of the Society of Biblical Literature and of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. Uh, he is the author of three books, the most recent being The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. So please join me in welcoming to this uh, podium Mike Lacona. Thank you, and good evening. It's great to be with you. I'd like to thank Veritas Forum here at UCLA for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate. I'd also like to thank Richard Carrier for the cordial and open email correspondences we've shared prior to tonight's debate. The question before us is, did Jesus rise from the dead? And for me, this is one of the most interesting as well as important topics for discussion. Let me explain why. About 20 years ago, I went through a period of intense questioning of my faith. I was in graduate school at the time, specializing in the study of New Testament Greek and planning on going into the ministry. But at that time, I began asking uh, the tough question, how can I know if Christianity is true? I believed I had an intimate relationship with God at that time, but I started to wonder, is this really the case or was I really just self-deluded? So I took a step back from my position of confidence and began to look at Christianity as well as the evidence uh, for many of the major world religions. I also considered the arguments for atheism. And after several years, the majority opinion is that he died by asphyxiation, and our understanding of crucifixion supports that conclusion. As the ninth, fourth, as the 19th century liberal scholar David Strauss noted, even if Jesus had somehow survived crucifixion, he couldn't have convinced his disciples that he had been resurrected in new life. Imagine Jesus half dead in the tomb, and so he wakes up in the dark and he wants to get out. So he takes his hands that have been pierced by nails, places them on an extremely heavy stone, and pushes it out of the way. And then he's met by the guards who say, where do you think you're going, pal? And he says, I'm out of here, guys. Then he beats them up. And then he walks blocks, blocks, if not miles, on pierced and wounded feet in order to find his disciples. Finally, he finds where they're at. Peter opens the door and sees Jesus hunched over in his pathetic and mutilated state and says, Wow, I can't wait to have a resurrection body like yours. 
No, he would have said, let's get you a doctor. You need help. As Strauss went on to say, there's no way that Jesus in his in the state could have convinced his disciples that he was the risen Lord of life. Alive, barely. Risen, no way. In summary, we can know that Jesus died by crucifixion because it is multiply attested by both Christian and non-Christian sources. The chances of surviving crucifixion were bleak, even under the best of conditions. The uniform professional medical opinion is that Jesus died, and Strauss's critique that says even if Jesus had survived, he couldn't have convinced his followers that he had been resurrected. Thus, given a strong evidence for Jesus' death by crucifixion, without good evidence to the contrary, the historian must conclude that Jesus was consensus document on what we can know about Jesus apart from theological or faith considerations. That resulting document would portray what scholars refer to as the historical Jesus. Now, the real Jesus who walked the shores of the Sea of Galilee may have been more than portrayed in that document, but he's nothing less. Tonight, I'm going to focus on a few facts from this type of research that we can know with a high degree of historical certainty that concerns Jesus' resurrection. So obviously, I'm not arguing that the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. It's more like what Tom Cruise said in the movie A Few Good Men. It doesn't matter what I believe. It only matters what I can prove. Let's look now at three facts that are strongly supported and acknowledged by an impressive majority of today's scholars. Fact number one, Jesus' death by crucifixion. Nearly 100% of all scholars agree with this conclusion. Let me provide four reasons why we can be confident of this. First, Jesus' death by crucifixion is multiply attested by both Christian and non-Christian sources. Second, the chances of surviving crucifixion, even under the best of conditions, were bleak. Crucifixion and the torture that usually preceded it was an unspeakably cruel process and may have been the worst way to die in antiquity. Many of us have seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, and have witnessed the brutal practice of scourging. This practice is likewise mentioned in um, ancient sources. For example, Josephus in the first century refers to a can you guys hear me out there? Okay. You can hear me? Okay, great. Josephus refers to a man who had been filleted to the bone. A second century document called the Martyrdom of Polycarp mentions how the Roman whip could expa expose a person's veins and arteries. The victim was then forced to carry his crossbeam outside the city walls where then Roman soldiers would take nails and impale a person to a cross or a tree. Then he was left hanging in excruciating pain. In fact, the word excruciating comes from the Latin, out of the cross. In the first century, a Roman historian named Seneca described a crucified victim as being long sickly, already deformed, swelling with ugly welts on shoulders and chest, and drawing the breath of life amid long drawn out agony. Josephus referred to crucifixion as the most wretched of deaths. Only one account exists of a person surviving crucifixion. Josephus reports of seeing three of his friends crucified. He ran to the Roman commander, uh, Titus, who was one of his friends, and, and uh, told him about it. And Titus ordered that the three be removed while alive and provided the best medical treatment Rome had to offer. In spite of this, two of the three died. Thus, even if Jesus had been removed prematurely, be it intentionally or unintentionally, his chances of survival were still very bleak. But to complicate the matters worse, there is no evidence whatsoever that Jesus was removed while alive or that he was provided any medical care whatsoever, much less Rome's best. Third, we can understand that while some debate remains among medical experts regarding the actual cause of death by crucifixion, they are nearly a single voice in saying that Jesus most certainly died from being crucified. Here's I came to the conclusion that what I had originally believed had been revealed to me by God's Spirit had now been manifested or or I should say confirmed by history, science, and philosophy, namely that God exists and that he has actually revealed himself to mankind in Jesus Christ and that Christianity is true. The case for the resurrection of Jesus was especially influential in my decision. Now the reason Jesus' resurrection is so important is because the truth of Christianity hinges on it. Jesus' atoning death and subsequent resurrection have been bedrock doctrines of Christianity since its beginning. If they didn't occur, the foundation collapses and Christianity is false. The Apostle Paul himself wrote, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. 
On the other hand, if Jesus was actually resurrected, then it seems there's good reason for believing that Christianity is true. Given this, I think we have a problem if we say, well, my worldview just doesn't allow that. Well, if that's the position you find yourself in, it may be time to change your worldview. That's why this evening's discussion is much more than just an academic debate. The eternal destiny of our souls may very well hinge on what we do with Jesus and his resurrection. So where do we begin? Historical Jesus studies. The eminent historical Jesus scholar, John Meyer, explains it like this. Let's say we have a Jew, an agnostic, and a Christian. This is not a joke. A Jew, an agnostic, and a Christian, all honest historians, all well acquainted with first century religious movements, lock them up in the Harvard Divinity School Library and tell them that they can't come out until they've hammered out a 